What is up besties? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Scotty Holiday. I'm a queer creator and a huge Star Wars nerd. So if you're into either one of those things, please consider subscribing for more. Today we got chapter 21 of The Mandalorian season three, The Pirate, and let me tell you, this episode just kept on giving. We got great action, great character development, and it actually moved the plot of season three forward, something that's been lacking these past few episodes. But before I get into my thoughts on the episode, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to my channel and leave a comment letting me know your thoughts on chapter 21. I'm putting out weekly reviews for each new episode of The Mandalorian Season 3 and you can check those out along with all my Mando content and the link in the cards and the description as well. Now let's get into this review. Episode 21 starts off on Navarro catching up with Grief Karga as he's alerted to the arrival of the Pirate King Gorian Shard's flagship in the atmosphere above the city. Grief receives a call on the comms from Shard announcing his intentions to shoot first after his men were gunned down in chapter 17. Grief tries to reason with him, lying, saying that Navarro is under the protection of the New Republic, but Gorian Shard calls his bluff, makes his knowledge of Navarro's independence known, and begins firing down on the city below. Watching the people of Navarro run for their lives, trying to avoid the explosions and debris, made me a bit uneasy, if I'm being honest. It was a pretty dark sequence to watch. Seeing these scenes played out also proved just how vulnerable Navarro is without a marshal or the protection of the New Republic. From here, we cut to a tropical planet, following a Y-Wing as it flies into the seaside New Republic base, Adelphi. Immediately, the music in these opening shots felt very similar to the in-universe music created for Jedi Fallen Order, which I also loved. Inside the cantina, we see a bunch of New Republic pilots eventually stopping on Carson Teva at the bar, as the bartender informs him of a message. As Captain Teva plays the recording, we learn that Grief Karga is humbly asking for the New Republic's aid against Gorian Shard and his pirates who've taken over the city by this point. As the message ends, we see a large purple Lassat in a blue rebel pilot uniform approaching Teva from behind and hear the very familiar voice of Zeb from Star Wars Rebels. As soon as he came into the shot, I literally had my mouth wide open until the end of their conversation because I never expected to see Zeb in live action and I never expected him to look so good. From here, Carson Teva heads to the New Republic headquarters on Coruscant to request assistance for Navarro, meeting with Colonel Tuttle, played by Tim Meadows, who I thought was a perfect fit for this role. As Captain Teva explains the situation and plays Grief Karga's message, their discussion is interrupted by none other than Elia Kane who conveniently mentions that Navarro is not a part of the New Republic. This of course causes an issue for Colonel Tuttle, but Captain Teva tries to sway him, explaining the pirate's takeover could be connected to Moff Gideon's Imperial Remnants activity on the planet, advising Tuttle that Moff Gideon also never made it to trial. But Colonel Tuttle shuts him down, saying this isn't a rebellion anymore, with Elia Kane butting in, spouting off amnesty program buzzwords, until the Colonel sees Captain Teva out, giving him a we'll see what we can do. This sequence also felt like an outright confirmation that Elia Kane is working undercover, infiltrating the New Republic amnesty program, either still loyal to Moff Gideon or the Empire itself. After leaving Coruscant, Captain Teva uses the signature of R5-D4 to track down Din Djarin, relaying Grief Karga's message. He says the Empire is growing and tells Din, I just came to tell you your friend is in danger and I thought you should know. This conversation is enough to get Din on board, eventually asking the other members of the Children of the Watch to join him. Din really shines in this moment, rallying the other Mandos, offering them a chance to live in the light. Paz Vizsla opts to speak next, and I was extremely surprised to hear him not only back Din and Bo, but rally the other Mandalorians to their cause, and I think Din and Bo were extremely surprised too. Afterwards, we get an amazing montage of Bo-Katan prepping the other Mandalorians for battle as they travel through hyperspace en route to Navarro. I really love watching Bo take charge because it really seems like it comes so naturally to her, proving how great of a leader she can be and it was just a great lead up to their arrival on the planet. These moments also brought me back to the Clone Wars Season 7 and the Siege of Mandalore, which y'all know I love. We get a short look at the devastation and destruction of Gorian Shard's attack before seeing the N1 approach in the skies above. This marked the beginning of a really great dogfight between Mando and Gorian Shard's men. As Din draws out Vayne and the other fighters from the flagship, pulling the pirates' focus away from the city, Bo is able to drop in the first group of Mandos from the gauntlet. As the battle continues in the sky, the first group of Mandos make their way into the city, taking out pirates, fighting their way to the city courtyard, providing all the badass Mando pew-pew scenes you could ever want. 
The build up to the courtyard was really fun and tense, but once the Mandos were pinned down by the pirates, the shot seemed to linger on for a little too long for my liking. The armor even gets a chance to shine, taking out a group of pirates in Grief Karga's office, clearing the way for the Mandos to finally take the courtyard, gaining control of the city. The armor is kind of scary in the way she attacks so brutally. The scene afterwards of her standing on the balcony of Grief's office had a very ominous vibe, and I feel like I still can't trust her. The remaining pirates try to make a run for it, but are met at the city entrance by Grief Karga and the citizens of Navarro, and they eventually surrender when the Mandos catch up to them. In a final stand, Gorian Shard turns his flagship on the city and begins firing towards the people below, but Bo gets the kill shot, taking out the ship's final engine, causing it to fall and explode into the outskirts of the city, taking Gorian Shard and his entire crew down with it. Once the dust settles, Grief gives a speech thanking Navarro's Mandalorian liberators, gifting them a huge chunk of land on the planet in return. My favorite line from his speech to the Mandos was, You may no longer have a home planet, but you do now have a home. Carl Weathers is so great in this role. Just when I thought this would be the end of the episode, the camera cuts to Bo-Katan as Paz Vizsla tells her the armorer wishes to speak with her. Now I was super nervous that something bad was going to happen to Bo as she and Paz made their way down into the sewers. I was scared they had been plotting against Bo and luring her down there as a trap, but the armorer began speaking to her about the old forge and the great forge on Mandalore. The armorer compares the two forges, one large and ornate and the other small and simple, but explains that regardless of their differences, they both serve the same purpose. Then she asks Bo to remove her helmet, which I was not expecting and and I was scared of what might happen to Bo if she did, like it was some kind of trick. Even though Bo is hesitant, she eventually removes her helmet, and I had no idea what to expect next. The armorer tells her that the Mandalorians have strayed from the way, and though a few still walk it, they all must walk the way together. To which Bo agrees, but what really caught my attention was how the armorer reiterates that all Mandalorians must walk the way together. She confirms that Bo's Mythosaur sighting is a sign that the next age is upon them, stating that all of Mandalore must come together, telling Bo, you have walked both worlds, you are the one who can unite us. I really didn't know what to think or even how to feel because I haven't been a fan of the armor and the way for so long, but for once I was actually agreeing with her, believing that what she said to Bo actually made sense. The conversation about the forges was clearly a metaphor for the Mandalorians versus those who walk the way, or even about Bo, a member of a royal Mandalorian family versus the armorer, a simple leader of a small Mandalorian covert. In the final scenes on Navarro, we get this amazing shot of the armor and bow walking side by side, one with their helmet on and the other without, coming together despite their differences under a common goal. I loved seeing all the other Mandalorians' reactions to the sight even before it's revealed to the audience. The armorer speaks first, explaining that Bo is going off to rally other Mandalorians in exile so they may all come together again. Paz pushes back, saying, but she shows her face, and the armor repeats, Bo-Katan walks both worlds, and she can bring all tribes together. Bo's face in this moment seems so proud, but also so validated hearing this from the armorer, and I'm honestly so happy for her. This is truly the best way this could have played out, and I am just so happy to see Bo continue to rise among the Mandalorians to be the leader she's always meant to be. I still can't believe this all came from the armorer, but even did nods in approval. Then, in an unexpected final scene, we cut to Carson Teva flying through space in his X-Wing, eventually coming across a damaged, abandoned Lambda-class shuttle. He calls in the site and sends a probe out to investigate as the operator researches the records, confirming this ship to be the one that was transporting Moff Gideon for trial. From the probe, Captain Teva determines there were no survivors on board, nor the body of Moff Gideon himself, confirming this is an extraction, but what he does find is a fragment of Beskar embedded into the wall of the cabin. And that's the end of the episode. So now that the plot of Season 3 seems to be moving towards reuniting the Mandalorian clans and retaking Mandalore, what Mandalorians from other Star Wars media do you think we could see come into the series? On top of this, what Mandalorians, if any, do you think could be working with Moff Gideon and or the Imperial Remnant? My guess is the Mandalorians loyal to the Empire, like the members of the Imperial Super Commandos, previously led by Gar Saxon. 
I don't know about y'all, but I'm also still a little worried about the armor and her true intentions. Do y'all think she really believes that Bo is the one to reunite the Mandalorians? I want to believe her because I do believe Bo will be the one to rule Mandalore in the end, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So what did you think about chapter 21? Let me know in the comments below or hit me up on Twitter so we can chat more about it together. Please consider checking out all my Mandalorian videos at the link in the description and on the end screen of this video as well. I appreciate your support so much. To keep up with all my Star Wars content, make sure to subscribe and consider following me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ScottyHolidaySW. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, may the Force be with you.